Okay. Um, <clears throat> you can see and hear me okay, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot, Abby, and thanks, uh, Sakura, for, for uh, having me here today, and thanks for um, Integrated Ocean Observing System as well. Um, so I'd like to give start off with just giving a brief introduction to our, our research lab and, and what we do. Um, we started uh, about 10 years ago here in, at the University of South Carolina, Beaufort, um, and uh, started, you know, mostly doing acoustic communication work um, with invertebrates, fish, and, and marine mammals. And along that lines, we transformed to soundscape ecology. And, and then, you know, that sort of led us into, um, you know, bringing, bridge, bridging the gap between soundscape ecology and environmental monitoring of estuaries, um, as well as uh, population ecology and biodiversity and of invertebrates and fish and population monitoring of bottlenose dolphins. Um, at the same time, understanding and, and hoping, under, uh, you know, understanding how maybe cl climate variability, water quality, and perhaps noise might, may affect um, soundscapes. <clears throat> So here's our team. Um, these are the people that get out there and actually do all the work. Um, I, I really want to give uh, kudos to my past lab manager, Agnesha Monsek, um, and my current lab manager, Alyssa Marion, and uh, field manager, Bradshaw McKenney, as well as all the, all the students that have helped this, um, this work uh, materialize over the years, including my current graduate students, Jamili, um, Sudan and Lindsay Transu, Caroline Tribble, um, current USCB students, uh, Evan Bowman and Anu Kappelman. Um, but, you know, well, a lot of this work um, is, is really, we're an undergraduate research lab as well as a graduate student lab. So a lot of this work has is, is just been, um, you know, materialized by all these students, um, which we also provide a lot of opportunities for undergrads. So what will I talk today? I'm going to talk about um, the soundscape of the May River estuary, which is our, our longest estuarine soundscape that we've been monitoring. Um, then I'll move to soundscape phenology and biodiversity and notice the Arctic hare over to the, the left there. And that represents a, you know, a mismatch between uh, climate and, and, and changes in, in color of a, of a snowshoe hare. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that and hit upon that in, in, in as we move forward. Um, and then we'll talk about fish courtship sounds and how they correlate with juvenile fish appearance and then end with our, our Estrin Soundscape Observatory Network of the Southeast. So I'd like to start with this slide. Um, why is long-term monitoring so important? So I'm not sure if people are familiar with what we call the shifting baseline syndrome. It was introduced by Ian McCarg and then uh, eventually a fishery scientist named Daniel Pauly. And th the theory is, is that you know, each person evaluates the condition of the environment based upon its state when they first experienced it. So changes to the environment are evaluated from this initial baseline. Thus, each generation accepts the environment in its degraded form as if it were normal, overlooking the changes the environment has, has undergone before their lifetime. So if you were to think about it, marine ecosystems in the 1800s and then in 1950 and then in 2019 or 2020, I mean, things have changed dramatically. We didn't, due to you know, a lot of um, human-made stressors, and we don't have a, a long-term long data sets to, that really go back to 1800s, obviously. Um, but that is really in a nutshell on, on why long-term monitoring is, is so important, obviously. Um, but within this, you know, we can't forget the nat natural rhythms, natural disturbances that occur to marine ecosystems. And that sometimes are hard to, to decipher amidst the different pressures that humans are, are putting on uh, marine ecosystems. 
<clears throat> so if we think about soundscape ecology and, and what is soundscape ecology, um, well, soundscape ecology is, you know, a, a rather new, newish novel field um, over the last, you know, 10, 5 to 10 years. But it's really understanding all the sounds in, a, in an ecosystem, everything from biological sounds to physical sounds to human-made sounds. So we're finding that this could be a useful tool in monitoring marine e ecosystems because many organisms produce sound. Um, and you can eavesdrop on animal behavior at multiple levels of biological complexity, everything from you know, your, your snapping shrimp to fish to marine mammals. And it's useful in estuaries um, where visibility is limited. And the key is that the technology lies high temporal resolution. So if we were to go back in 1800, to 1800 or 1950 in 2019, we'd go back in a time machine and we could, we actually were able to deploy, you know, hydrophones in our, in our oceans, estuaries, you know, what, what the soundscape sounds like in 1800 compared to today is probably much, absolutely much different. Um, so, you know, that's where, um, that's why soundscape ecology is, is, is important. Um, we started monitoring the soundscape of the May River estuary in 2012. Um, and we started with really a, a short-term study where we, we looked at a course acoustic recordings um, at 27 stations. So the May River estuary, just to give you an understanding, it's in, on the border of uh, Georgia and South Carolina, <clears throat> just over the, 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 the state line just a little north of the Savannah River. Um, this estuary empties, empties into the Calabogie Sound, which then empties into the Atlantic Ocean. And this is, um, you know, up way up here, the headwaters, and here's the mouth of the estuary. So it's a tidal river estuary that has extreme tides up to seven to eight feet, seven to 10 feet. Um, and we, you know, when we, first started off, we just wanted to understand what different types of organisms produce sound. What, you know, what, what do we have here in this estuary? And we did these short-term acoustic recordings at 27 stations. And we, you know, I'm going to give you, we found out that there's a lot of fish that make sound in this estuary, um, similar to other estuaries across the Southeast U.S. Um, so we, we published a paper in Transaction American Fisheries Society on, on the different types of fish species that produce sound. Um, and then we went into deploying our, our DSG ocean recorders um, through, uh, which are made by loggerhead instruments. Um, and um, in 2000 and 2014, we had six stations here highlighted in, in black. Um, <clears throat> and those recorders, um, you know, they have a hydrophone and they have a, a big battery pack. And, you know, we put some temperature loggers on there and some depth loggers. And, you know, we, we started off with a duty cycle of two minutes every 20 minutes. Um, we, and we just went from March to December. So we, we didn't, you know, we didn't uh, record during the winter time. And then we realized shortly soon after there's a lot of data to handle. And uh, we downsized. Um, we downsized to areas that we, you know, had some great spawning aggregations of different species of fish, and and were, um, you know, heavily utilized by bottlenose dolphins. Um, and uh, we we monitored those uh, recorders year round, uh, where our duty cycle was two minutes every one hour. Our sample rate was. Um, 80 kilohertz, so we can resolve between one hertz and 40,000 hertz or 40 kilohertz. And, um, you know, what did we find? Um, so let's talk about some of this information. Obviously, snapping shrimp snaps. Um, so snapping shrimp, remember that they've got a, there are a variety of different species. Um, we're not 100% sure of all the different uh, species that um, reside in the May River estuary. We're still learning more about that, but, you know, snapping shrimp have a big claw and they snap that 
claw shut, produces an air bubble, it collapses and you get a snap sound and the snaps are vertical and broadband. So this is a spectrogram where you have time on the X axis and, and, and Y is a um, frequency. And so it's a picture of sound for those of you that aren't familiar with spectrograms. <clears throat> Um, but you know they they have a big claw here and they snap that claw shut and um, produces a snapping sound kind of like risk rice crispies i'll play this sound um, i'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it hopefully you will um, sounds like rice crispies and they're vertical and broadband in fact you know we've been working with aaron mooney at woods hole oceanographic institution and you know these uh these, these snaps can be as loud as like 190 decibels. Um, they're broadband, one kilohertz to 200 kilohertz. Um, territory communication, that's what they're used for. We're not sure about foraging. You know, the, the long-term theory was that they were very important in foraging and we're, we're, we're wondering about whether or not that that's actually true now. We published some of this work um, in sound patterns of snapping shrimp fish and dolphins um, in uh, the Marine Ecology Progress Series. Um, so if you want to look up that paper, you can. Um, but some of the cool things that we've found by looking at um, the acoustic behavior where we actually identify and count the number of snaps in each two minute wave file. And that's what we have here. This is on the X axis is date. On the Y axis is time. And then from blue to a warmer color, red, is the snap rate or the number of snaps that are counted using a signal detector in MATLAB per two minutes. Okay, and then we, we plot that. So this is a, a heat map. And we've got temperature in red and daylight. So obviously, you know, this is, this is winter and then this is uh, spring and then stead summer and then fall. And what we really observed, obviously, is snapping increases in the spring and summertime. Um, this is at station 9M, which is further towards the headwaters in the May River estuary. And we see this, this diagonal pattern. And what that diagonal pattern actually, it, it's uh, oscillate. It's actually a pattern that is very similar to tide. Um, it's actually the low tide. So we found out that snapping shrimp tend to snap more in the low tide. So as the tide goes out, they tend to snap more. Um, we have a variety of reasons and, and hypotheses and why this may occur, um, but this is just one particular rhythm that I like to point out, a tidal rhythm in this particular species. <clears throat> so if we move to fish, you know, in, in the springtime, what a dominant species is silver perch. And this is a, I'll, I'll play a silver perch evening chorus for you, which which dominates um, the the sounds uh, in the springtime in, in the evening. Oops. So this is silver perch chorus. You can see this is a the energy here. The acoustic energy is um, you know low frequency to about you know around two kilohertz. Um, remember, males have sonic muscles, and they beat um, those those muscles against their swim bladder, and that produces a call. And the males produce these sounds to attract females to a spawning location. So very important in courtship and spawning behavior. Um, if you want to learn more about this work, we published um, this was a feature article in 2017 on long-term acoustic monitoring of fish calling. Um, I provided that reference there for you. But that's the dominant sound that we would hear in the springtime. So let's move on. And, and then in the summer, spotted sea trout, um, they dominate the, the, the evening chorus in the May River. And they produce grunts, drums, and staccatos, and the, the, you know, where the peak frequencies are around 100 to 700 hertz. Again, very important in courtship and spawning behavior. I'll play a chorus of spotted sea trout for you here. There you go. So you can see that if you stuck your head underwater in the evening in the May River, this is what you would hear. 
to a really loud chorus. And in the fall, we tend we hear um, late a late afternoon chorus of red drum at the mouth of the May River. So these are much lower frequency pulses because the fish are much larger, you know, between 100 to 600 hertz. Um, right here, and you can see these pulses again used for courtship and spawning behavior. I'll, I'll play this sound. It might be a little low, but hopefully you can hear it. right there okay so a uh, red drum really really uh interesting species we only would hear them at the mouth of the may river estuary so not you know so we think that's really the only spawning aggregation in this estuary now this isn't the only fish species that make sound but we wanted to highlight these uh three species we also have oyster toadfish black drum atlantic croaker um probably a bunch of different gobies and then a bunch of different species we yet have yet to identify um, but if you put the patterns of fish courtship sounds and let's just focus on station 37m the mouth of the may river you know we can so when we review these acoustic files um we manually review our files. We're working on signal detectors. Um, we have some that are able to identify, you know, black, black drum oyster, toadfish, silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum. We published some work on that. Um, there's still, you know, do you know they're not a hundred percent accurate. Um, they do provide, you know, those signal detectors do have false um, positives, false negatives. Um, so we're still working on perfecting those detectors. So right now we're manually reviewing files. And when we manually review a two minute wave file, we score each species based upon zero, no calls, one, one call, two, multiple calls, and three chorus. And then we add those, those values up for the day or the evening. So we sum the calling intensity score per evening. And so we can really give you spawning timelines with the exact start and end dates for calling and chorusing. And we, we, we come up with a reproductive or spawning potential, which is really the number of hours chorusing per year. And this is what we represent here um, for the year 2013 um, for black drum in blue here, and then oyster toadfish in, in this purplish color and silver perch here in green, um, spotted sea trout and sort of smurf blue here, and red drum in orange. And we plot the, the lunar cycle, um, we plot temperature, and we plot daylight hours. And, you know, we found a lot of different rhythms. I won't go into those yet. Um, but one really interesting is a uh, spot interesting uh, rhythm is how spotted sea trout are very finely tuned to the lunar cycle. And you can read more about that in our papers. Um, and then finally, uh, we also, you know, we count bottlenose dolphins vocalizations, things like echolocation here in one, whistles two, and burst pulses three. This is a, a sound clip of some burst pulses here. Now we tend to see seasonal increases of dolphin vocalizations at the um, detected at the mouth of the May River. So this is just one station representing um, them at the mouth of the May River, 37M, and I'll, I'll quickly guide. This is all the way from 2013 to 2019, and this is um, representation of echolocation, burst pulse sounds, whistles. No data here, either due to um, when we weren't monitoring in the winter time, and then sometimes you do get a failure of a recording system. Um, 
water temperatures in red here, and you can see the oscillating uh, signal due to seasonal changes in temperature, and then the hour of daylight in brown dotted line here. And then you can see echolocation, the total number of echolocation bounce that are summed per day. And we plot those in burst pulses and whistles. And one of the cool things that we saw and observed at station 37M was seasonally we get these in, in, in the winter time, fall and winter, we get this massive increase in um, echolocation, burst pulses and whistles. Um, we think that this has something to do with changes in feeding ecology. Um, they're having to echolocate and, and to find more food and maybe not relying so much on passive listening. Um, we're also trying to relate this, these data to um, visual survey data. You know, so we, we actually have a survey program where we, we monitor um, bottlenose dolphins in the May River. We go out once a month in the May River. We count the number of dolphins we see, put their location. So we're combining visual surveys with our passive acoustics monitoring to have, get a better understanding of, of why we see these patterns. So in a nutshell, um, by listening, we can understand key behaviors in organisms that occupy different trophic levels. And the key here, it's done at a high temporal resolution, rather than like, going out and doing a dolphin survey where we we do it once a month we're listening you know two minutes every every hour so there you go there's there's 24 data points rather than just one data point per month so you're getting a, a lot more data you know and we're from an ecological point of view um, we're able to look at multiple trophic levels everything from snapping shrimp um, calls and courses a variety of different species and then finally, um, um, apex predators like a dolphin. So healthy sound, soundscape, maybe healthy estuary, and that's what we're, we're trying to move towards. Finally, um, one thing that you, you discover is noise pollution. And so um, we published a paper on, on boat, boat noise in, in, in the May River estuary and how there's a lot of noise at the mouth of the May River, um, largely because it's um, at the intercoastal waterway Boats are loud, even recreational boats. I'll play a little clip for you here. Um, this is a, a, a clip of us taking our dauntless uh, four-stroke, 90 horsepower um, by, a, by a recorder about one meter away when we go by. You can hear how loud that noise is as it approaches that recorder. So much greater than, you know, we're getting decibel values much greater than 150 dB, probably more like 165 maybe. Um, so noise is an issue um, in the May River, um, just like every other estuary. And, you know, we have we do have recorders in Charleston Harbor now. Um, we've been monitoring that soundscape since December 2017, and that's a major port. So you're dealing with ships, ferries, um, dredging, um, I'll touch upon that at the end of the talk. So that's the May River estuary soundscape, okay? Um, you get an understand of some of the players that pr uh, produce sound, biological sounds. So let's move a little bit about into um, some of our work on soundscape phenology and, and biodiversity. So specific, you know, we published this paper this year. Um, Aga did a great job um, in getting this paper done. We submitted, we got this published in PLOS One. What's all the racket, soundscapes, phenology, and biodiversity in estuaries? The, some of the goals here, we wanted to, you know, determine temporal patterns of high, low, and broad band frequency sound pressure levels over a six year time span in the May River estuary at these different recorders, 9M, 14M, and 37M. Um, we wanted to determine how certain environmental factors influenced these sound pressure levels. And we wanted to examine the phonology of acoustic activity of snapping shrimp and fish. Phonology meaning the timing of when they're 
um, snaps or their choruses um, started per season and how that related from one year to the next. Um, and then finally looking at uh, temporal patterns of species richness and abundance and examine how these indices correlate with the soundscape. So that's when we integrated staining into our um, passive acoustic recorders data set. So we created a staining program um, in 2016 with the help of Bradshaw McKenney. He, he was amazing here. He was an undergraduate here at USCB for um, and he graduated and, you know, he started the staining program, an amazing, um, he's finished, he, you know, he, and then I hired on, hired him on as a field manager and he's just done a great job here. Um, but we sained from 2016 to 2020 um, with the help of undergrads, interns. So we had about a, a, a solid four year data set as we stopped in January, 2020, kind of when uh, COVID started a little bit before then. Um, we sained six to 12 tidal pools, creeks or shoreline habitats monthly on the low tide, right? And we selected randomly from a pool of 50 sites near our listening stations from the headwaters to the mouth. So here are the headwaters, so here are acoustic stations, 9M, 14M, and 37M blue. And then we have our, um, you know, saning stations in yellow. And then our water quality stations, where we took monthly temperature, desalinity, dissolved oxygen, and pH. And our really endpoints were species abundance per meter squared, which is a sane area. And we also measured their lengths of, of, uh, of species for other of the individuals, the first, first 50 individuals. So a lot of work here. We, we were able to accomplish 440 sayings. Um, and so, you know, you can see here, this would be on the low tide. We'd, we'd put up a block net and we'd say in a certain area, um, measure the dimensions so we can get our um, catch per unit effort. And here are all our, our catch. We put the catch in a, in a, in a big cooler, we get a little, bubbler go and try to keep them alive which they, they stay alive a lot in the winter in the summer they end up a lot of them die um and you know we catch all sorts of species which i'll show you but you know here's some cool big head sea robin southern flounder um uh plain head file fish you know none of these produce sound um that i know of. well actually sea robins do sorry sea robins do produce sound um but then again, you know, we wanted to know abundances and diversity. So the first step that we wanted to do is just understand sound levels, right? So um, we, we selected bandwidths that represent snapping shrimp and fish courtship behavior. So we measured the sound pressure level of each two minute wave file, a root mean squared sound pressure level, which is really kind of measuring the overall sound level. We, we had one every, everywhere from 0.1 to 40 kilohertz. Um, and then we did low frequency, 50 to 1200 hertz, which really represents fish, chorusing, and then high frequency, 70 to 40 kilohertz, that really represents snapping shrimp sounds, okay? And so, This is the a time series of the high frequency sound pressure levels from 2013 to 2018. And this is at 9M, this is at 14M, and then this is at 37M, right? And this is from 2013 to 2018. And you can see um, in black here is temperature. And then in the dotted lines is daylight. And so, and then the the heat map that we present here, and then this is the time of day, and then again, this is date, and this is what we're representing here are the, and from the cooler colors to the warmer colors is really the seven to 40 kilohertz root mean square sound pressure levels. So it really represents the snapping shrimp snaps, mostly higher frequency. Um, 
So what we notice is that the SPL sound pressure levels increased and decreased with the seasonal temperature ranges, right? And you can see that, you know, as it when it gets cooler, it gets quieter. Um, 2018 was our coldest winter here, and that we found out that that had the lowest sound pressure level. The other thing we did is we'll talk a little bit further about this is we did phonology. Um, basically, these green dots represent essentially the first probabil posterior probability change, which basically when we detect a major jump in sound pressure level. Okay, so that starts getting us an understanding the phonology of the soundscape in this estuary. Okay. So let's look at low frequency sound pressure levels, which represent fish courtship, which are focused on 50 to 1200 Hertz. Really a, a kind of a, a whole, um, just some, you know, grouping all these fish together like black drum, oyster toadfish, silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum. And how the SPLs increased um, in the spring and summer evenings. And that's what you see as it begins to get warmer each season, you begin to, you know, then courtship starts of silver perch, then falls with oyster toadfish, then spotted sea trout, and then in, you know, in with with ends in the fall with red drum. Right. And again, look at 2018 was our coldest winter, right? And it had the lowest SPL. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that we had a really cold winter and we, we kind of see a little decrease in some of the, um, you know, some of the courtship calls here for fish species, which is probably spotted sea trout. We're exploring that. We're trying to understand that a little bit more. Um, but that's the overall uh, gist of, of, of these low frequency sound pressure levels, which are representing courtship. So if we if we look at soundscape phonology, I'm going to try to guide you through this uh, figure here, where we look at the phonology of acoustic activity of snapping shrimp, which is high frequency SPL in fish, um, and we really detected the date of the first abrupt change in sound pressure levels. And then what we found in years with higher mean spring water temperatures. Then the and this is the this is here representing um, high frequency sound pressure levels. This is representing low frequency sound pressure levels, and this is broadband. And this is year, uh, the year 2013 and 2018, and this is the day of the year. Okay. And so what we noticed is that um, in years with the higher mean spring water temperature, right? You know, we we tend to see um, you know, that the high, low, and broadband sound pressure levels, that first peak occurs earlier, right, as compared to years with lower mean spring water temperatures. And so temperature here is the dotted lines and the solid lines, and one is for station 9M in blue, and one is in station uh, 14M in orange. And what you can see essentially is that in years in which um, it's a warmer spring, then the sound pressure level jumps up qu quicker in that year for low and high. Um, and we found that there were negative correlations that occurred between this mean spring water temperature and the timing of the first peak, peak and probability of change for high, low, and broadband SPLs. Um, low was a little iffy, but definitely with high and broadman. Okay, so let's move to biodiversity. So in our sayings, we, we got about seven different invertebrate species, everything from gra grass shrimp. Yes, we caught snapping shrimp, um, brown shrimp, manna shrimp, obviously blue crab, spider crabs, and, and, and these cool brief squid. Um, we caught uh, about 58 different fish species, uh, representing 31 different families, everything from cool Atlantic needlefish to Atlantic spadefish to feather blennies, oscillated flounders, yeah, even some uh, great barracudas, Atlantic cutlass fish, 
pig fish make sound, big head sea robin make sound. So some really cool different cool species, 58 different fish species in our sands. We look at, if we look at, um, start plotting. Um, so I'm gonna show you these figures here, 9M, 14M, 37M. We still are representing sound pressure levels in, as a heat map. Um, this is actually one to 40 kilohertz. Um, and uh, we have temperature here in red for each station. Um, so the background is just how loud it is, okay? And what we're putting in the foreground is, and in black here, is species richness. So each saying, um, we actually count the number of species um, per meter squared, and we plot species richness. Um, and then as well as uh, species abundances. And what we showed is that lower species diversity and abundance during the winter, obviously, and higher species diversity and abundance during spring and summer. And that temporal pattern of species diversity and abundance follows the warming and cooling patterns of the estuary, as well as the oscillating pattern of the biological soundscape here, okay? So pretty wild. Um, so our conclusions is that we show that, that the transition between winter and spring is a dynamic time period with an increase in biological sound during the spring, which mirrors the increase, you know, we didn't measure phytoplankton and zooplankton, but presumably how estuaries work, that's when, you know, phytoplankton and zooplankton increase dramatically inverts and fish abundance that drive changes in primary, secondary, and tertiary productivity within estuaries. So the bottom line here is that biological sound is mirroring the increase in primary, secondary, and tertiary productivity within estuaries. And in years with warmer spring temps, um, this seasonal transition occurs earlier than in years with cooler spring temperatures. And that means that temperature plays an important factor in initiating certain behaviors, spawning, et cetera. And early occurrences of these behaviors reflect an organismal response to climate variability. Okay, those are our conclusions. So I wanna talk a little bit more, running a little bit behind on time, but we'll, we'll keep going. Um, I wanna talk about fish courtship sounds and how they correlate with juvenile fish appearance. Okay, so now let's go into actual fish species and courtship sounds. So we wanted to examine the patterns of fish calling in the May River estuary over a six-year time span from 2013 to 2018 and determine how environmental factors influence fish acoustic activity, which I won't go over, um, just a just briefly, and then I wanted to, we wanted to investigate the correlation between fish calling and the young of the year appearance and abundance from 2016 and 2018 from our SANING program and examine the phenology of fish calling and your appearance. We're still working on this paper, um, but it's getting there and we hope to submit it in the next uh, probably three or four months. Um, Oops, oops. Okay, so here's our year-to-year -year patterns of fish calling at the mouth of the May River estuary. So this is all the way from 2013 to 2018. And again, you've got water temperature and daylight, okay? And here is black drums, so black drums in blue. And so this is, again, summing up all those call intensities per evening and then plotting those here. So that's black drum, then silver perch, then spotted sea trout, and then red drum. So you can see they have specific time frames, specific seasonal timelines in which they chorus. You put all that information together, it's, it's really neat. Um, and we can look at this for each station, 9M, 14M, and 37M. I'll, there's there's the data for that. Um, so from 2016 to 2019, 
remember we monitored the abundance of fish using Hall Sains, right? And the thing about these uh, tidal pools, tidal rivers, and, and you know um, sides of the creek, you know they're just a reservoir for um, young of the year black drum, spot, silver perch, red drum, and spotted sea trout. And, you know, they were challenged, you know, these fish are, you're talking about species, you know, catching species that are, you know, 10 to 15, 20 millimeters in uh, length. And, you know, it took some of a, it was challenging to identify these individuals, but we had a great fish biologist, Bill Rumelet at South Carolina Department of Natural Resources that, that helped us identify these young of the year. Um, but, what we ended up doing is we wanted to correlate the fish calling and the young of the year appearance. When did they appear? When did we first start getting these um, young of the year in our sains? And so if you look, we look at silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum from 2016 to 2018. Again, we've got some calling intensity and, and we're looking at stations 9M and 14M mostly here. Um, and then, and so what you end up seeing is that, yeah, you see, you see silver perch calling in the springtime, and then all of a sudden you start picking up the, the young of the year about a month later in Sains. Um, so this is the, the abundance of those, of those, uh, young of the year in our Sains. So you sum them up between, um, for the Sains between stations 9M and 14M. And you see the same thing with spotted sea trout, you know, because spotted sea trout have an extended spawning season. You, we pick them up, you know, shortly at shortly after when spawning season just begins, but we can continue to get them throughout the summer into September, and that's every year. Remember, you know, we're saning during these time periods in the you know in the winter time, and we're, you know we're not catting any of these young of the year. So. Um, Pretty neat to see how um, the young of the year correlate with um, fish coursing. And then to see red drum at the mouth of the May, you know, we would catch these uh, red, red drum in the late fall or in early winter. So really neat to see how the appearance is tightly correlated. And then one of the really fascinating things we found is how um, there's a correlation between fish calling and the young of the year abundance. And so if we look at spotted sea trout, what we have here, 2016, 17, 18, is a mean abundance. And then in the black line here is the percent hours calling, right? So you see that the, 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 Abundance of yoy correlates with the amount of calling that they that silver perch did for that that season, and um, the same thing occurs for spotted sea trout and red drum. So essentially, the more that uh, silver perch, spotted sea trout, red drum course in a season, the more young of the year we're finding in sains. So um, I wanted to just talk a little bit now about where we're headed. I only got about, um, this won't take much longer. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our Estrin Soundscape Observatory Network of the, of the Southeast, um, or ESONS, which is being largely supported by Integrated Ocean Observing Systems now. And, and so we monitor the sounds of four estuaries in South Carolina using our long-term passive acoustic recorders. And we're recording, you know, every, you know, multiple levels of biological complexity from snapping shrimp to silver to fish to bottlenose dolphins, yes, and even American alligators. Um, we get alligators um, in headwaters, um, especially in the May River. Um, this is an interesting, um, interesting animal that we did not expect to hear, but we hear them really cool. Um, I won't play that, um, but maybe down if I'll play it if we have some extra time, I'm just not sure you'll be able to hear it. Um, 
But the thing about ESONs is that it overlaps in space with fishery independent surveys performed by South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. So they're a major player now. They they really are helping us out, and we're we're working with them in our four estuaries from May River Estuary here down south in the state to Chichesse Creek, Carlton River, and Port Royal Sound at Charleston Harbor to North Inlet, Winya Bay, we have recorders now in these, these different estuaries. And in those same estuaries, Inshore Fisheries Division of South Carolina Department of Natural Resources performs um, electrofishing in yellow, uh, trammel net surveys here in red, and long lining surveys. Um, the est and, and some of these, locations they also have estuarine trawl surveys right and so if we look at our future goals is are, are to correlate soundscape endpoints with biodiversity abundance from south carolina dnr surveys and so you look at our may river area here 9m 14m and 37m these are estuarine trawl surveys that have been occurring over the last 10 years here um, and we have recorders here in Chichesse Creek and Colleton River. And we have areas where ester and trawl surveys and trammel net data and long line uh, data are being collected. Um, and way up here in the North Inlet Winya Bay and in Charleston Harbor. So the, the goal is to correlate these soundscape endpoints with biodiversity and abundance of, of fish species. Um, we also have our dolphin surveys um, that occur both in um, the May River and Chichesse Creek, Carlton River, and uh, um, we were, we're working with folks that do dolphin surveys in Charleston Harbor. So the goal is really to bring in, you know, more of the abundance and diversity data um, that other that we and others are collecting and correlating with soundscape endpoints. With regards to fish, what we're hoping to do is looking at how climate variability and courtship calls correlates with reproduction year class strength. And we're looking at silver perch, a spring summer spawner, spotted sea trout, a summer spawner, and red drum, a fall spawner. And so we have the acoustic data that gives us the total number of hours coursing per year which provides um, through saning, we're able to get yo abundance per year, electrofishing abundance per year, South Carolina. So we, we have a way of going from reproductive potential, near-term reproductive success, medium-term year class strength, and long-term year class strength. So that's all um, I, I have. Um, I'd like to just point out some acknowledgments um, um, that Aga, um, she was our past lab manager, PhD student, a lot of this work, she's she's completed amazing, amazing, amazing scientist. Um, Aly Aly Alyssa Marion is our new lab manager, Brad, Sean McKenney, all of our, our graduate students and all of our undergraduates. We just have a team of undergrads here at USCB that have just are phenomenal workers. And, uh, you know, we've we really put them to work I'd um, like to give uh, kudos to uh, Jake Morgenstern, um, from, who's now at Waddell Mariculture Center at South Carolina DNR, as he's helping a lot with our saning data. Um, and of course, uh, South Carolina DNR, Mike Denson, Steve Arnott, Joey Ballinger, Bill Rumelette, Justin Yost, Georgia Southern, Yiming Ji, and our, our NIMS permit number for marine mammal work. Um, all of our funding sources, long-term data sets require long-term funding and that's not an easy thing and a, not an easy task to accomplish um, but it was helpful for all these different funding sources and thank you to Secor and IOS who's helping us now. Um, questions? Great thanks so much Dr. Monty. Um, we had one question come in and if you guys have any questions just type them into the chat box and I'll read them to Eric. So this one is from Aaron. How did you match the sounds received on the hydrophone to species that made the sound? Do you have a sound library? Yeah, we, we have a sound library. We've done a lot of work with, well, for spotted sea trout and red drum, um, we've done a lot of work um, with captive 
um, animals with the help of South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. They had a um, they they have an incredible uh, spawning program um, where they spawn um, fish in captivity and they raise the young and then they release the young back into the wild, both for scientific and hatchery purposes. But for spotted sea trout red drum, that's not a problem. For the other species like silver perch, I mean, you know, that's in the literature. Um, so, um, you know, those are, you know, a lot of this is just literature based or captive work. Great, thanks, Eric. Sure. And then we have another question from Rick Cole. Did you manufacture your own loggers or are you using an off the shelf model? Uh, for recorders or loggers? Looks like loggers. Okay, so for temperature loggers and depth loggers, those are from Hobo. Hobo water temperature loggers and, and, uh, and um, yeah, hobo water temp and hobo water level loggers or pressure loggers. The salinity ones, be careful of hobo salinity loggers. Um, we've experimented with them about you know five, eight years ago. That you need to be careful of those. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have a few more questions coming in. Have you looked up? Soundscape metrics like acoustic complexity index and acoustic richness index. It would be super interesting to compare the latter with your same data. Yeah, you know, we've stayed away from those um, indices. I know some soundscape biologists like those metrics. I am a little hesitant on them, largely because of snapping shrimp. They, snapping shrimp, you know, they, you know they're they're so broadband and i'm just and then also with boats and noise i just fear that i'm yeah you might it might be it might lead to we haven't and i i, I know we, we'd always be willing to share our data to do that but that's not on our on our to-do list great thank you um, we have another question. Are there times the fish are present but not producing sound, so they would be undetected by PAM or PM? Well, yeah, of course, like wintertime. I mean, they're not making sound. They're not making sound during their their spawning seasons. I mean, we don't we don't we do not we don't hear any silver perch, spotted sea trout, or red drum in the winter. Very few calls. I mean, it, it's minuscule calls. Um, so yeah, they can be present and, you know, during their non-spawning times. I mean, it, it is a dramatic difference. So I, I, I'll never forget the time I was in the mouth of the May River and it was back in 2011 or 12 when I was rather, we were rather new trying to figure this out and it was so loud and the May River was like, it cannot be this loud. It was silver perch. I mean, it was just massive massive chorusing of silver perch throughout the estuary it's amazing um but then you go out in the winter time it is quiet just snap it's a little snapping shrimp you hear dolphins but it's like a desert out there in the winter time and Great, there's obviously thanks. fish there makes sense um this one is from bonnie to date has there been any work looking at the soundscape data and the acoustic telemetry data no, there hasn't. I mean, it's a great idea. It's a good, be great proposal. Um, there's a lot of great things you can do combining those data sets. Um, it's something that we, you know, we, we would be interested in doing and pursuing with collaborations. Um, we have done a lot of modeling, not modeling, um, uh, we've done a lot of toad arrays to using a let you know an electrical motor to um sort of map the aggregation um especially of spotted sea trout um and we've done a really good job of pinpointing where the aggregation we've tried to use some active acoustics to find the aggregation and that's been a challenge um using an eris explorer um that's been a challenge because we could hear the fish but we couldn't see them um, using active acoustics, but I think it was the field of view of the Eris is just um, rather too detailed, actually. The field of view is too small. 
But we I haven't wish. done acoustic telemetry. It'd be cool. Um, we have another request. Can you play the gator sound? Okay. Let me see if you can hear it. So um, everyone turn up your speakers. It's really low frequency. Gators are really cool. I would love to do more work with alligators. Um, you know, it's all a matter of how much time you have, obviously. But alligators are so cool. All right, hold on. Let me see. Why is this? Okay. Ready? I don't know if you can hear that. I could not hear it. Yeah, you probably won't be able to hear it. It's too low. It's too low frequency. I'm trying to figure. I'll figure a way somehow to to make it louder. It's just it's just quiet. I can show you a spectrogram of it. You want to see a spectrogram quickly? Here, let me do that. Is that okay? Yeah, that is totally fine. Um, see my screen. Folks, yeah, we can still see your screen. Okay. All right, come on. We do have um, one question yeah, from sure. Jennifer Dorman. Uh, okay. Are the results extendable to other estuaries in South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina, or are the results location specific? You know, you know, we're that's why we're doing that. We've expanded to four different estuaries. So Chichesse Creek and um, Carlton River, we found very similar results. We're, you know, Charleston Harbor. I mean, Charleston Harbor is a noisy harbor. I mean, it's, you know, we're finding out that a lot of these patterns aren't as visible in in Charleston, which is sad, you know, obviously, but it's it's a port, and that's really interesting, you know. And I think you'll see more data coming out over the next few years of Charleston Harbor um, in our work um, with with estuarine soundscapes in a harbor, you know, and and how dramatically different the soundscape is. Um, and and uh, we've got a, a recording system of in Winya Bay, Nash, uh, North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. We hope to expand that array. And I think that'll tell us a little bit more about, you know, what, a, what maybe a pristine soundscape sounds like. Um, that may be quite different, right? Um, because it's much further north. Um, but I, you know, you know, I think if you talk to folks like in, in, um, you know, Jim Lacosio and David Mann down in, in West Florida, I mean, I think they're, they probably have very similar soundscapes. Um, you know, they've got a lot of the same players, silver perch, spotted sea trout, red drum. Um, they've got bottlenose dolphins. Um, so I think, you know, I think a lot, some of these soundscapes may be similar, but, you know, one of the reasons why you might have to manually review files first to kind of figure out what your, who, your, who are your players. I don't know if I, I don't, I hope, I hope that answered your question. Well, Jen can find you if it didn't. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's a spectrogram of an alligator call of two alligator calls and you can see very low frequency so you know here's on the on the on the y axis way over here it goes from 0 to um, 40 kilohertz and if you zoom in and on the on here is time this is a 10 second clip so you can see this is the alligator call here alligator call and you can see most of the energy is very low frequency okay very low frequency. And that's probably one of the reasons why you're having some troubles hearing it. I'll play it one more time, so listen. Yeah, okay. I probably can't hear it, but there it is. That's what it looks like. I heard the two calls. Oh, you did, good, good. Yeah. Awesome. Notice one thing, you can't hear this portion because it's probably below our hearing range. Yeah, I heard the last one very well. Yeah, yeah, cool. Interesting. Yeah. So that's it for questions. Um, 
So thank you guys for joining us. We're five minutes past the hour. Thanks for those who stayed um, late and asked such great questions. And Eric, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Mm. We're gonna post a recording on our website and I will just um, go ahead and share my screen so folks can see that. So it's gonna be posted on sakura.org front slash webinar dash series. And it usually takes about 72 hours to post. And um, that's it for today. So thank you guys for sharing your lunch hour with us. And Eric, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Mm. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Thanks. Great, no problem. Have a great day. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye guys.